All right, so I want to do something a little different for today's terrain. It might look like we've gone back a video because I don't have the island code in here, but the water is still there. Um, I want to show you an alternative path you can take. So I showed you in the last video how to convert our procedural generation into the shape of an island. What I want to walk through this time is how to make it infinite terrain. So if I were to change its position within the world, if there is a mountain over here, I want that mountain to still be in this exact physical position, this world space position, not local to the terrain. So when I move this, I expect it to do that. So I'm going to walk through the code of how this operates. Effectively, you can run the exact same process on two pieces of terrain that are right up against each other. So as they're right up against each other, um, you want the various rises and falls in the terrain to match up. So this is effectively guaranteeing that they will. And it just automatically does it for you. So how does it work? For one, we're going to need to check where the, our x position is because the onValidate function doesn't take care of this, but that'll be a secondary thing. The offset is pretty basic, but I do need to get the real world position and there's kind of this complex transform just in the understanding of why you have to pull variables in from particular spots. So let's go straight into there. Uh, well, sort of one step along the way, I want to show what the code was before. So you don't have to go back to the old video or pull up the old code or whatever if you have it or don't have it. I want to explain that difference. So when we were going through the mesh, and we were seeing what changes had happened, or, or what to apply, we were using our Perlin noise based on its X and Y position within the array. That has no real world connotations whatsoever. So we need to change this. We need to effectively figure out its real world position. And so I'm going to give you a different set of code for this. Like this is X and Y according to the int X and Y up here. Let's go check out our code now. So this is the new code. Instead of getting it from X and Y, I'm now getting it from X and Z. Uh, one thing to look at on the terrain, um, this is the X and Z axis, the Cartesian surface, the map, a, car a cartograph. Uh, the Cartesian surface is spread out along the X and the Z axis. So that's how we get our surface, not X and Y. Um, so that makes sense why that's set up the way that it is. Gravity is flowing along Y. Up and down is flowing along Y by default. Those can all be changed. So now I'm doing it uh, for X and Z. But I'm also getting it from V, a vector that I just created up here. So how are we generating that? Well, before we get there, I do need two special variables leading up to it because I'm using both scale and size in this equation. So first off, I get the terrain size. Now, the terrain height map resolution by default is 513 by 513. So its height res is 513. Now, that doesn't relate to the size. The default size, like the, the boundaries across the X and the Z axis, expand out for 1,000 meters. So effectively, by the time you're at 513, you are at the 1000 meter mark. When you are at zero in your X and Y position in the height map resolution, you are at zero within the world space. So we need to convert this. So we're going to take the size and we're going to divide it by the height map resolution. So if the size is 1000, we're going to divide it by 513. So we then get something close to two, a decimal uh, near two. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our scale and multiply it by those positions. Now, you'll also notice these are way off. This is scale X and or Y and Z being multiplied together. This is where some of the confusion settles in. OK, but we are effectively taking that axis and we are stretching it out. Uh, so we have the scale X and the scale Z. <clears throat> and so any position we give it, if we are at position 0 times 2, then we get 0. If we are at position 500 or 513 times that uh, decimal, that, that 2 point something or 1.9 something, uh, 
that we end up getting our 1,000 meter mark. We end up hitting 1,000 meters when we put in that 513 for the index, or sorry, uh, 512 as it comes out to here, 0 to 512 versus 1 through 513. Okay, so that's how we're getting our, our position within the world, that, that we're using that information to get there. Now, I explained about the fact that we're not using X and Y, that traditionally when you're using a 2D array, the X comes first, then the Y, not for, for the height mesh in terrain. It doesn't match up with real world understanding, and I think that they just had some glitch, some kind of confusion when they were setting it up, and it didn't really matter because it wasn't tying to real world space. Um, they were testing it for a single object and being manipulated by tools, not by code. Um, well, the tools are code, but whatever. Uh, so they effectively just worked with it, and then by the time it came out and was being was in use, uh, this would have been tough to change because this would have screwed up anyone else's code to fix this. But effectively, their X and Ys on their their mesh are reversed. So the X goes into the Z coordinate. They should have kept it with the X, like X and Z. Seriously, just keep the X in the X. Um, but then also the uh, for the y or the x position, I'm actually getting that from the y value. But then I have to multiply it by the scale of z. So it's confusing because its real world position is in z, it is in that uh, uh, z axis. So I have to multiply it by that in order to get its position within the world. But it's our y position in the array. Anyway, if you go through the headache of actually trying to do this on your own, which I've had to multiple times when I've forgotten it or didn't know where I had a piece of code on the past on it, this is effectively what it is. It, you take your Y, the Y from the height map's position, uh, 2D array, and you multiply that by your scale Z. Um, your, si your, your Y position, how high it is within the world, there's a hack that I have in here on this one. Um, this one doesn't really care about its position within the world. Um, it sort of does, but I'm not using it, I guess, is one of the key things. Uh, there are future pieces of code that I will be, so I wanted to keep that in there. Okay, so on this one, scale Y, or for this one, I'm not using a scale for the Y position. The scale would be 600 divided by height res, but the height res doesn't apply to up and down. It's only to across the Cartesian surface. Okay, so I'm basically just taking our, posi our our height, what are we, scale, size Y. So our size Y is 600, for instance. Um, that's our size, it's, it goes from zero to 600 by default. Of course, that can be manipulated so you can set it and this will get whatever its actual height is set to. And then we multiply it by our mesh X, Y. So we're getting our X, Y position and that gives us our height for that coordinate. Honestly, I might need to reverse the X and Y on this spot. Um, I need to double check that, but I'm not using, ha I don't have anything that uses it yet. So I might need to fix that coming back to it, but if it is, it's literally just switch the X and Y. Okay, and then on the last part, the scale X times uh, X, but I'm putting that in the Z coordinate. So this is how you get its real world position which means that for the rest of these pieces, when I'm trying to evaluate what its height should be at this particular x, y coordinate, I'm giving it the x and z according to the terrain. And so when I end up sliding it, it keeps its position within the world, not local to the object. Okay, so I'm just gonna set that back to zero. Oh. All right. Now I'm gonna dive into a couple of the other changes that I made in the code to make this operate a little more smoothly. Um, one of the first things is we're using on validate to determine when to execute this code again, to reprocess it. But on validate only works for the fields that are part of this component. If I change a different component or I change the transform like I'm doing here, whoops, like I'm doing here, on validate doesn't capture, so we need another way. And that also involves putting some protections in place so we don't shoot ourselves in the foot later. 
OK, so let's dive into the code and see how those editor features work. All right, so scrolling up to the top, I'm calling out that this is I'm reminding you that this is already in execute always. The previous scripts were also in execute always. OK, so since this is in execute always, that means our update function will now execute inside of the editor when the game is not running. This does not run at the full FPS you would expect. Um, an editor update is only when something in the scene changes. So if something in the scene changes, it triggers all the updates so it can redraw everything how it's supposed to be laid out. Um, of course, it's only going to do it for this object. But that also means that if I have this in here, that it's going to be in the game starts, it's going to be executing this code continuously every single frame. Now, that's only on the transform has changed. So I'll, I'll explain that one in a second. So one additional thing is that in the start, even though I have execute always, start does not execute with this. That is a big thing. When you are in the editor, start does not execute under an execute always. The update does. And I'm not sure about awake. I think awake might, but I'm not positive. That's it. Test it. If you need to depend on it, test it. I haven't needed it right now, so I'm not, and I don't tend to retain the knowledge that long. OK. So this dot enabled equals false. I just disable it. So if the game actually starts, this script turns itself off so the update never even executes. But otherwise, then we're doing something else where we're talking to the transform, and transform has this really useful Boolean field called has changed. And it's pretty obvious. But if this has changed since basically the last time an update has executed, then this will be true. Great. We know that something about the transform has changed. Its scale, its rotation, its position. And then if that's the case, then I will just call on validate again. I could just put in the two functions to redraw the terrain mesh and then update the height map. Uh, in here instead, but I tend to prefer putting all my logic for that into one spot and then just re-executing the command that validates whether or not I should run it. This is just another thing to trigger the on validate. Okay, so that's how I effectively get that. This, this is how we do this stuff, uh, how we end up getting our position within the world uh, from our terrain, our height map X and Y. And then this is how we execute it. We do an update from a script that is in execute always, and it will always run. And so that's where we are. Then that leaves us with the ever fun part of this, this code just being able to change dynamically wherever we are. So then if I change, I can do more things and have fun here, which I'm going to do. So I have time for this other little video to pop up over here in the corner that uh, will show you what the next video is when we have the opportunity. Uh, let's see, distance from edge. Oh, I'm not using that one because it's not an island. Um, but I can manipulate these ones and get different island shapes. There, I like that one. Oh, and uh, one thing that I did, the only thing I did to the code to get rid of the island code, if you're actually curious, is inside of here, instead of, <laughs> instead of using the edge reduction map, I just multiplied by one. We're still technically processing it. We just don't do that last multiplication step. Um, and then we end up getting our, our, our final value from this. So it acts like a, a land mass instead of the actual island mass. OK, so that is our code. That's it. Hope you like it. Uh, if you have any questions, please comment on it. Um, if you if there's any directions you want to see this go, please post in it, uh, post in the comments, and I'll see if it's something that I'm comfortable with that I've done before. I will I'll, I'll gladly work it in there, particularly if it can be done relatively easily, where I can make a, a simple video out of it. All right, thanks.